Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, with my Week 6 2015 NFL predictions. Well, this week, I had a solid week. I improved from my 9 6 record last week to uh, up to a 9 and 4 record. So I, I shaved two losses on my record. And now, overall, for the year, I am 49 and 27, which means I gained a full percent <clears throat> on my uh, predictions. So now I'm at 64.5% for the year. Very good. I'm happy with that. Uh, again, if I can continue to string good weeks together, hopefully I can uh, get up to that 70% <clears throat> range. I don't think I've ever hit that in the numerous years that I've done picking. But uh, we will soon see. What a crazy week five. In the NFL, we had three incredible overtime finishes in uh, Cleveland, or in Baltimore, in Cincinnati, and uh, da, 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 I'm to think here, which one was the other overtime game? The other overtime game. Uh, but yeah, there were there were three great uh, overtime finishes in uh, in Week Five. They were uh, incredibly entertaining. Uh, <coughs> we saw uh, a lot of big injuries. Um, I'm going to give my uh, or my prayers uh, to Char uh, Jamal Charles. Hopefully his knee uh, can get better, even though unfortunately I heard it was a torn ACL. You hate seeing those kind of injuries, especially the one he had, which was a non-contact one. But again, that's about probably about the fourth or fifth non-contact ACL injury we've had this year already, which is which is awful because uh, Jamal Charles is one of the best running backs in the league, and he is definitely basically Kansas City's offense. So I definitely think now the future is bleak for this Kansas City Chiefs team because everything that's gone on. Uh, let's see. We saw Denver's defense continue to show why they have powered this team to a 5-0 start. Um, you know, an incredible defensive performance um, by <clears throat> by Denver Wade Phillips. He is my assistant coach of the year, definitely defensive coordinator of the year, because the way this defense is playing, it's the number one ranked defense in the NFL, and with just how they get to the ball, how they get sacks, and how they get turnovers, and how they score points off turnovers, because they've scored the most points on defense in the entire league. Um, it's uh, quite shocking. Because I never thought I would say with Peyton Manning at offense that defense would be leading the team. Um, <clears throat> though amazingly, I found this out. The Broncos are actually 4-0 when Peyton doesn't score, score a touchdown. Or doesn't throw for a touchdown. That's quite unbelievable, actually, when I found that out. But, <clears throat> kudos to the Broncos. Um, let me see here. Any other little tidbits? Again, tonight I am taking uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers to beat the Chargers. So everybody out there that forgets from last week, that's what I'm taking tonight. Or, yeah, I'm taking Pittsburgh to beat San Diego tonight. It should be a really good game. And it could be a huge booster for the Pittsburgh Steelers if they can leap a full game behind the, uh, the Ravens. Or two full games behind the Ravens and one full game behind the Browns. Um, but enough about last week. It's time for my picks. All right, this Thursday when the five and zero it, it let oh geez let me, let me before I start I just realized uh, I need to tell everybody who's on by this week the Dallas Cowboys, Oakland Raiders, St. Louis Rams, <coughs> and Tampa Bay Buccaneers are all on by this week. So I know Romo, Dez, even though they're already hurt, Cowboys defense, Derek Carr, Amari Cooper, Latavius Murray, um, the Raiders defense, Michael Crabtree, uh, Nick Foles, Todd Gurley, who's had a heck of a two game stretch. I think he actually ran. For the most yards by a Ram since Steven Jackson in 2008. Um, and then uh, Tampa Bay, Jameis, Mike, Vincent, Doug Martin, Tampa's defense if you have them. I wouldn't have them, but those are the four teams that are on by this week. So if you have any of those players on your teams, bench them because they are not playing this week. All right, time for my picks now. <coughs> On this Thursday, when the 5-0 and Atlanta Falcons go to the 1-4 and New Orleans Saints, I am taking the Atlanta Falcons. And 
then on Sunday, when the 5-0 Denver Broncos go to the 2-3 Cleveland Browns, I am taking the Denver Broncos. When the 2-2, two and two, sorry, uh, let's see, 2-3, and three, I'm sorry, when the 2-3 and three Chicago Bears go to the 0-5 Detroit Lions, I am taking the Chicago Bears. When the 1-4 Houston Texans go to the 1-4 Jacksonville Jaguars, I am going to take the Houston Texans. When the 5-0 Cincinnati Bengals go to the 3-2 Buffalo Bills, I am taking the Cincinnati Bengals. When the 2-3 Washington Redskins go to the 3-1 New York Jets, I am taking the New York Jets. When the 1-4 Kansas City Chiefs go to the 2-2 Minnesota Vikings, I am taking the Minnesota Vikings. When the 4-1 Arizona Cardinals go to the 3-2 or 2-3 Pittsburgh Steelers, I am taking the Arizona Cardinals. When the 1-3 Miami Dolphins go to the 1 and 4, te uh, 1 and 3, Tennessee Titans. I am going to take the Tennessee Titans. When the 4 and 0 Carolina Panthers go to the 2 and 3 Seattle Seahawks, I am taking the Seattle Seahawks. When the 1 and 4 Baltimore Ravens go to the 1 and 4 San Francisco 49ers, I am going to take the San Francisco 49ers. When the 3 and 2 or 2 and 3 San Diego Chargers go to the 5 and 0 Green Bay Packers, I am going to take the Green Bay Packers. And then on Sunday night, when the 4 and 0 New England Patriots go to the 3 and 2 Indianapolis Colts, I am taking the New England Patriots. And then on Monday night, when the 3-2 and two New York Giants go to the 2-3 and three Philadelphia Eagles, I am going to take the New York Giants. Alright, time for my thoughts on each game. Atlanta and New Orleans. Uh, I have to say, New Orleans, I, uh, I almost believe it's time for Sean Payton to get fired or to be relieved of his duties as head coach of the New Orleans Saints. Sean Payton was willing to let Jimmy Graham go. Sean Payton, I, I know this is the GM's decision, but Sean Payton had to know about this. <coughs> he was willing to let Jimmy Graham go. He was willing to let Kenny Stills go. They only, they got Brandon Browner. They, Keenan Lewis has been basically out. Uh, Spiller and Ingram really haven't done anything, and they re-signed both of them. You know, not the bad deals, but definitely they're not even getting investments out of there. And just the way they looked against Philadelphia. Like, my God, Sam Bradford had his best game as an Eagle in a win. Okay, even though, I, you know, you could say, well, he threw those two horrible red zone interceptions. I get that, and they were, uh, they were terrible interceptions. But they didn't win the game. So, in a win, this Eagles offense looked the most explosive it looked the entire year. It looked like the Philadelphia Eagles we had seen in the preseason. Um, so what does that say to, you know, Rob Ryan and Sean Payton about how they've coached this team? And again, Drew Brees... <clears throat> had a okay day, even though again, he did fumble two times, which is tough. But again, when you have an offensive line that's as uh, kind of porous as, they, as theirs been, you almost feel bad for them. You almost feel bad for him because he doesn't have that much time to do anything. Willie Snead keeps on having, you know, phenomenal games. He had one or, <coughs> 141 yards, you know, against the Eagles, you know, and, and he was a practice squad player on the Browns a couple years ago. But I uh, just look at the Saints team, I'm just not seeing a collective, consistent unit. The running game is sporadic. Um, you have an offense, or you have definitely guys that analogs the ball. They are, they are turning over the ball at a rate that's never good. Um, and it's just sad when I, when I look at the Saints team. And I, I say Sean Payton should get fired because... He had a seven and nine year last year at the helm. Okay, so remember he had a thirteen, uh, you know, eleven and five record a couple years ago after the bounty gate, which they went seven and nine. <clears throat> and I'm looking at it going. <clears throat> he's only won two playoff games in five years since the Super Bowl, and to have the expectation of trying to get to five hundred at least, I would say to the Saints, <clears throat> Saints fans, and the organization. It's t maybe time to let Sean Payton go. Because I just, I could not convince myself to keep him after giving him a losing season. After the expectation was given in 2013 that we could go possibly farther to the Super Bowl. Then to have two losing seasons, I'm sorry, I would possibly consider that trade rumors that I've heard and maybe give him to Miami. Which would be kind of ironic because again, when Drew Brees was a free agent after San Diego... He was choosing between Miami and New Orleans, and they in New Orleans was able to win that, but then Miami could win the coach. So, I digress.
But I'm going to take Atlanta in this game. <clears throat> um, they played a very hard and physical game <clears throat> against the Washington Redskins. Um, and maybe I should give that more a credit to the Redskins than maybe blame on the Falcons for letting them compete this long. Because I have to admit, you know, that Miami loss looks more obscure and awkward as this season's gone on. Because the Redskins actually are a decent team. Maybe a little bit above decent. Remember, this team that beat the Rams, even though, again, the Rams look pretty pathetic against Green Bay, but I'll get that in a second. <clears throat> but, you know, you look at this Atlanta team, um, they were playing the number two run defense in the league, even though, again, Devontae Freeman <coughs> <coughs> was able to get about 85 yards on the ground to 70, you know, receiving. But, again, he did have that bad red zone turnover, and uh, if it wasn't <coughs> for... Uh, Ryan Grant falling down and uh, Robert Alford getting a pick six. We could have seen the Atlanta Falcons lose. But again, the Atlanta Falcons continue to find ways to win games, which is incredibly impressive. This is the first 5 0 start they've had since 2012. And I think Dan Quinn is, in my, one of my opinions, one of the candidates for Coach of the Year. Because again, this was a 7 9 squad last year, and they've already almost. They've already almost got to that win total by the fifth week of the year. You know, it's incredible. But when I look at this game, if Sam Bradford and that offense can do what they did, just imagine what Devontae Freeman and Talvin Coleman, combined with Matt Ryan having Jones, White, and uh, Hankerson, who could be, you know, out, you know, he's questionable, <coughs> can do it <coughs> against this New Orleans defense. And I know New Orleans, you're all pumped up. You can say, well, nobody's going to win in the Dome anymore this year. We beat the Cowboys. But that was a Brandon Weed in an overtime. This is Matt Ryan and the Atlanta Falcons, who are a more, much more legit team than the Dallas Cowboys are right now. So again, it, it should be pretty lopsided. You know, I put my faith in New Orleans, and the Inks showed up, and uh, Tampa already beat them in the domes. Already, they're already 0-1 in the dome against NFC South opponents. With this Atlanta team of how they've been firing, just in all cylinders most of the time, I don't see the Falcons losing this game. With, with that offense going into New Orleans after what the Eagles offense did in Philly. So that's why I'm taking the Atlanta Falcons to beat the New Orleans Saints. Um, Denver over Cleveland? Um, this basically just came down to defense. It's that, actually, when you really look at it, this is, I know it's going to be amazing. But Josh McCown, and I'm going to be honest here, has outplayed Peyton Manning. And, again, he's completed about 68% of his passes. Throw for about 1,100 yards, has about five or six touchdowns and a pick. Those are actual stats. Peyton Manning, for the first time, I think, since his rookie year, or maybe his career, actually has more interceptions than touchdowns. Who would have thought that Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning, mind you, would have that kind of stat line? Um, and again, he didn't have a touchdown all yesterday. If it wasn't for Derek Carr making a horrible decision, throwing it to Chris Harris... <clears throat> the Raiders might have been able to pull that one off, but they didn't. But when I look at this game, I just got to go with the better defense. Because, and again, you know, I would still take Peyton over Josh McCown any day, but if you had to think about a defense, especially with Joe Hayden, um, who missed the game against San Diego, and he left the game against Baltimore, so if he goes down or if he's out for the game, I think Peyton, you know, definitely can exploit those leaving the corners of the receivers he has. Um, <clears throat> um, because the running games are pretty much about even. you got two committee guys. If I had to take Anderson and Hillman or Crowell and Johnson, I'd probably take Anderson and Hillman just by a slight margin. But when I look at this Denver team, I just got to go with the defense. I think this you know, this is going to be a low, another low-scoring game. But if, if I had to take Josh McCown having another career day against the Broncos defense, because, again, the Ravens defense is pretty much a, a, a you know, a wash. And I'll, I'll get to the Ravens, and I have a lot to say about, you know, my team in, in a second. But um, when, I look at this, <clears throat> when I look at this game, I would have picked Peyton over McCown, even though, McCown, like I said, McCown's played better than Peyton. But McCown has to go up against that Broncos defense, and Peyton has to go up against that Browns defense. It's going to be a tough game for both guys. But I'll take Peyton going up against the Browns defense right now, especially if Joe Hayden is out. Then 
um, Josh McCown going up against that Broncos defense right now, which is playing at an extreme level. And that secondary is looking like the Legion of Boom in Seattle right now. I'm just going to say that right now. I'm not saying that they have the hitting power, but they have the ball hawking and uh, they have the ball hawking ability that the Legion of Boom once had. Or once had over the last few years. This year, that's going to Denver. Um, again, it should be a low score. <coughs> Great defensive game. And I know for Cleveland fans, it's kind of like retribution because of 87 and 80. Uh, yeah, because of the two games, the 86 and 87, the drive and the fumble. Um, but I don't think they're going to get it this week. Just because, again, this, this, this Denver team's, this Denver defense is too strong. Especially against <coughs> any offense. So that's how I'm going to take the uh, Broncos to beat the Browns. The Bears at Lions. Um, wow, this you know, this is kind of an awkward game because honestly, you are looking at two <coughs> mirror reflections in the in an, in in the opposite way. Chicago's overachieved, uh, I, I believe, this year. Uh, the fact that they won their last two games with Jay Cutler at the helm, having no Alshon Jeffrey and Kevin White and no Jared Allen and no John Bostic, um, and just with the defense they had, you know, guys like Igor Ferguson, um, Ratliff, um, gosh, you know, those guys going, I, Shea McClellan, um, Fuller, you know, with all those guys on defense, it's actually one of the greatest coaching jobs I've seen this year. That the Bears have won their last two games. With as little talent as they've had. Um, and again, kudos to Jake, you know, that, that team. Again, they did have a block extra point, which is kind of amazing. Because you don't really see that, even though Pernodic Feed just basically found a huge hole. It was like parting in the Red Sea for, uh, for him to block that extra point. But... I look at Detroit and see the exact opposite. Detroit has all the offensive weapons. They have defensive talent. They traded for, you know, a Lodi Nada. They still have uh, Ziggy Ansa, <coughs> Grover Quinn, Ihedebo. They still have, a, you know, a decent core. But they're 0-5, and they have, also, by the way, they have Calvin Johnson, Golden Tate, Ebron, I know Belden played, but they have Amir Abdullah. <coughs> and uh, you look at these two teams, and you almost see like a mirror reflection of coaching and talent. That the Bears have been much more successful than the Lions this year with very little talent. Where the Lions have basically much more talent than the Bears do, but they're 0 5. And uh, one quick thing on Matthew Stafford getting benched. Um, I believe he is an all-time bust. Not maybe, you know, for a lot of things, you know, people say, well, he's not Jamarcus Russell or Ryan Lee. No, he's not. Okay? He's not that bad. But when you look at it this way, and I, I, I looked this up and I put this in comments on NFL.com, um, um, I said this. Back in 09, Matthew Stafford, you know, signed his six-year, $72 million contract about $41.5 million guaranteed. You know, again, I understand that was in the old CBA. Um, and I, would, I have, would I have picked up Matthew Stafford if I was on the old 16 lines? I would have. But during that span, out of a possible 64 games, he played only 49 or 45. Um, and in that 45-game span, he went 17 and 28. So with that resume, mind you, the Lions of 2013 gave him a five-year, $76.5 million extension on top of that with another $41 million guarantee. So, and he's gone 18 and 19 since that extension was signed. Okay? So just to remind everybody, this is just a recap. This is a man that's made a pot that can make a possible $148 million. And I'm pretty sure, you know, the incentives are, you know... With the goals he has to reach, he probably won't make, you know, that much. But he can make a possible $148 million. Well, 82 or... <coughs> 83... 
83 million guaranteed for a 35 and 47 record. If that's not capitalism, that's not <clears throat> that's not capitalism at its finest. I don't know what is, but just to see him get benched like that, it's <clears throat> it's pathetic. Calvin Johnson <clears throat> made Stafford. I firmly believe that because Calvin's you know didn't didn't forget how to run, and that one that one pick he threw to Peterson, I think which was possibly the one that got him benched. That was such an underthrown ball. I think even Calvin was shocked about how bad he threw that ball. But again, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna take the Bears just because I see a mirror image. It's just almost like you have one team that's overachieving with very little talent and a lot of good coaching, and you you look at the other team and say they have a lot of talent, but they don't have really had that good coaching or they don't have as good a quarterback. Um, again, could Detroit win this game? Yeah, the Bears they their defense still has a tough time. But if I have to go off the five game samples that I've seen out of both teams, I gotta give Chicago the edge because. They've won with this talent. And they could get Alshon back, and they could get even get Eddie Royal back. Hey, look, their second-leading receiver was a guy named Cameron Meredith, an undrafted free agent out of little Illinois State. And they won a game against the Kansas City Chiefs. They won with that. No Eddie Royal, no Bushrod, no White, no Jeffrey, and they've won the lot, you know, they won the game against Kansas City last week, and they won the game against Oakland the week before. So, again, I think Chicago is well better coached and they've shown a lot more in the games <coughs> that they've played and I give Cutler his credit because he's actually had a decent year you know besides you know the two horrible interceptions at the end of the Oakland game which did not bite him and the, in, the, in the game against Green Bay which did bite him he's actually played pretty well which I, which should mean that Adam Gase their offensive coordinator should get a head coaching job because for Jay Cutler to play this well it's quite a miracle actually but I'm going to give the Bears this game and I know I'm kind of ranting about this um, because um, they've just overachieved with the very low talent they had. And I think that, again, against Detroit, I think they're going to get a few interceptions. And I think Jay Cutler, with the offense he has, <clears throat> can do enough to move the ball against this Lions team right now, which really isn't showing anything. And, again, for anybody out there, please don't give me the excuse of, oh, well, Matthew Stafford was the quickest person to, like, 20,000 yards. You know, he's up for 5,000 yards three seasons. I get that. Bravo! But I've said this in my videos before. Stats only get you so far. The fact that he would have that, you would kind of have, have to wonder. You know, and again, you could say, especially over the last couple of years, well, they picked up Joy Bell and Reggie, you know, <clears throat> until about 2012 or 2013. Well, he didn't have a running game. <clears throat> he didn't have a running game. Well, he said Joy Bell... Abdullah and Bush, you know, which, and again, Reggie Bush had a couple thousand yard seasons, so you can kind of, you know, forget that excuse too. But that's how I'm taking the Bears to beat the Lions. Houston over Jacksonville, um, the Jacksonville game, uh, just, it was, a, it was an incredible game, actually. Two, you know, it was an evenly matched game. Again, these two teams, you know, really can't beat anybody else. Um, but I, I look at Jacksonville and say that, <coughs> Their offensive line can't protect anybody. Um, <coughs> um, because Boyle's got sacked six times. Even though he put up a decent stat line, he, I think he threw for about, like about almost 300 yards, three touchdowns a pick. Impressive. You know, he's improving himself as a quarterback. But, um, yeah, the horrible fumble. And just also, just Tampa's offense had a lot of good movement, you know, with Evans and Jackson. Does Houston have that much dynamic on offense. Well, they do have Foster, which trumps Martin. Okay, I will say that. Um, but they had DeAndre Hopkins. And I think with how Jalen Strong came in, and by the way, his only two touch, his only two catches are for two touchdowns. So that's a good start. Good start for him. Um, but I'm just thinking, again, Houston's defense, you know, I said that they could, you know, dominate the Indy offensive line. I was wrong. Because Matt, Matt Hasselbeck <clears throat> was able to get the ball out quickly, and he, they didn't really even get a lick on him. This Jacksonville offensive line, I don't see Blake Bortles being able to throw the ball that quickly out or making good enough decisions by throwing the ball as quickly as Matt Hasselbeck did. And also, <clears throat> even though, again, I'm going to say this, I do want Jacksonville, you know, personally. Again, I'm just going to go a little diatribe here personally. I am going to take Houston just because, again, they have good enough receivers to beat up <clears throat> this Jacksonville secondary. I think Houston's defense can dominate 
Jacksonville's offensive line just like Tampa's did. But I do want Jacksonville to personally kind of win a little bit just because I didn't like the decision that, that Bill O'Brien made by benching Ryan Mapp. Okay, and I understand, you know, I was talking to somebody, and they're like, well, Ryan Mallard, you know, really didn't even deserve the job in the first place, you know. I'm like, well, you do realize that this man's played a grand total of six games. Six, okay? And it's six, okay? And I understand, he has not looked good <coughs> in most of them, okay? But to go back to Brian Hoyer, and I know he threw for about 312 yards, he threw for two touchdowns. He had a solid game. And he definitely put them in a fight. Even though, again, you could put up one of those touchdowns just to luck. Because he just chucked it up for Jalen Strong. And just like he did at US, USC and, or with USC and Arizona State, they were just extremely lucky that he caught it. Um, but Brian Hoyer threw, a awful, for, threw one of the worst interceptions I've ever seen. He just chucked it in the air on third and two. And Mike Adams caught it like a punt. Okay? Look, I'm not saying, and look, Ryan Allen, he had his facial expression. I get that. But, I just look at going, you're giving a guy only six games to just, you know, show himself? I'm not saying that, you know, you keep going after week after week. You know, maybe probably after week eight, I would have might said myself, okay, maybe, okay, Ryan, you've had about eight games. That's about half the year. And you got benched. Remember, Brian Hoyer already got benched this year. Four five out after week one. After Bill O'Brien said, oh, well, we're going to give, uh, Brian a leash. Really? That's a pathetic leash. It was only a game. You know, again, I, I don't think, you know, so I want everybody out there, give me an over-under on how many games um, Brian stays in, but <clears throat> I look at um, I look at Bill O'Brien and also I, I do want to point out that uh, last year against Jacksonville Brian Hoyer went 18 of 41 for, <clears throat> for about 115 yards no touchdowns and two picks. So he hasn't really played well against the Jacksonville defense anyway. Um, but I think, again, I, I do want Brian to lose just because, again, I want Bill O'Brien to realize how idiotic he looks right now. That he keeps flip flopping quarterbacks. I guarantee you, he's going to flip another one. He's going to go back to Mallet eventually in this year. And if he does that, I will lose all respect for Bill O'Brien because he does not have faith. And remember, these are the two guys that he picked. And he was angry at the media. He's like, oh, well, you know, these two guys can win games. Well, obviously, Bill, they can't. So, you know, I want Brian to lose. Just because, you know, again, you know, people might say, oh, you know, Ryan's pouty and moody. Well, Arian Foster threw down, you know, a Gatorade thing, and nobody talks about that. You know, I know Arian's a better player. I'm just saying. You know, nobody's angry. Arian, you know, was so angry he couldn't get back in the game. Um, but again, I'm taking Houston to beat Jacksonville, just because, again, Jacksonville's offensive line looked awful. I think Houston definitely can get, you know, through Jacksonville's offensive line. <clears throat> and Bortles doesn't have Hasselbeck's intelligence to be able to get the ball out quickly and make good decisions. Again, could this game be competitive? Yes, it could be. Like I said, I personally want Jacksonville to win. Um, just because of, you know, just to screw Brian Hort. Uh, but, I am going to take Houston just because they have more talent receivers, better running back, um, and a stronger defense to beat up the Jacksonville offensive line. Alright, there's that. Cincinnati over Buffalo. Um, everybody should be start drinking the black and orange Kool-Aid. You know, they are on a roll. And they won a game that nobody expected them to win. They played to the two-time defending NFC champs. And they were down 17 points. And the fact that they came back from the 17 points is incredibly impressive. And maybe that's the final nail in the Bengals' doubters' coffins. Okay, maybe myself. Okay, even though, again, I think actually I'm even starting to believe that they can finally win a playoff game. Because that's just a game that I, did not, I, I wouldn't expect the Bengals to win. Even though I know I took them last week and said, well, you took them to win. Well, the Seattle team's a lot different. Uh, um, but, you know, when you look at Cincinnati, I think that they, they can go on a huge run because I think they got Pittsburgh, Cleveland and Houston and they have their bye and they could probably go 9-10-0 before I think I think they play Arizona and Arizona and that's the game I expect them to lose um, if Arizona continues to play well I mean, then, you know, it doesn't happen but I'm going to take Cincinnati in this game just because Buffalo for 
just all intents and purposes, they got extremely lucky that they escaped Tennessee with victory. <clears throat> it's sad, you know. Again, I know, I know Buffalo did not have McCoy or Williams or Watkins. They basically didn't have most of their offense. But it's sad when your leading rusher is your quarterback, and that was for both teams, by the way. Um, but I, I just look at this Buffalo team, and I'm just going. You know, they they needed that win just to save you know save their season, but. This Buffalo team looks to me, as, I, as I've seen, okay, maybe a bit overrated, you know. Because, again, you look at who they've beaten. They beat a struggling indie team, which, I, you know, if they played right now, you know, I don't know if Indy, you know, I don't know if Buffalo could beat them again. They probably could have, but, you know, who knows. They beat a, you know, a pathetic Miami team. And they beat a Titan team, you know. So you could say, well, they beat the they beat the Colts. Yeah, that's pretty good, you know. But besides that, they beat the Dolphins and the Titans. This is a Cincinnati team that's beaten the two-time NFC champs, and you can say, well, they beat you know they beat, they beat they beat the Chargers, they beat the Ravens, and they're undefeated. And I, and I look at how pathetic that offense looked against the Titans defense. I think they could just look just as anemic against the Bengals defense. They're not going to be able to run as much, even though they expect Watkins back, which will be huge. <coughs> But if the Bills can't run the ball, I, mean, I don't think McCoy and Williams, you know, unless Williams come back, comes back from his concussion, I don't expect them to run the ball that well against the Spangles defense. And uh, you can say, well, Thomas Rawls, a backup from Seattle, had over 160 yards. You know, he had the most yards since Sean Alexander did in the game. I get that. But, you know, he got 80 of them on one run. You know, besides that, he had 80 yards on about 25 of the carries. So, you know, it's not that bad of a rush. But I'm not just looking at this Bengals offense and go, if that Bengals offensive line can hold up, I don't expect the, back, the the Bills corners to be able to hold up against A.J. Green and Jones and Sanu. They have a two-headed running back monster themselves. And if both of those guys can go, I'll take the Cincinnati running game of Hill and Bernard over whoever they're going to have. If it's Williams and Booby Dixon or if it's Booby Dixon and Boom Air. I just don't expect you know the Bills to be able to run that much. And the Bengals should be able to go in the Buffalo and give the Bills their third straight home loss. Um, it should be, you know, it could be a competitive game. Both these defenses are pretty good. You know, it's Rex going up against Marvin, you know, two defensive minds. Rex knows Marvin, obviously, from his days at Baltimore. You know, he replaced Marvin, uh, honestly, um, for all that time. But it should be a good game. I like, think Cincinnati, they have too much offensive firepower healthy, and I just think they have the confidence to just keep rolling into a game like this where they could beat a... You know, inconsistent, up and down Buffalo team that really hasn't beaten anybody, you know, solid besides Indy. So, um, that's what I'm going to take the Bengals to beat the Bills. Uh, the Jets over the Redskins, um, to me, it came down to this it's the secondaries. Um, I think that, you know, definitely the Redskins have definitely impressed me for the most part this year with how they play. <laughs> With how they played. They've been a lot more competitive in every game. But again, I still don't know why. I still don't know how they lost the game against Miami. <laughs> um, but I think that the Jets' secondary is the difference. And especially if Deshaun Jackson doesn't play. They're not going to have Culliver Hall possibly again. I, mean, I know they're not going to have D'Angelo Hall. They might not have Chris Culliver again which means Marshall and Decker on the outside. The Jets should be able to get a decent passing game going. I don't know how well Chris Ivory's going to do against, you know, this uh, Redskins uh, front, but I think Ryan Fitzpatrick can play a good enough game, hopefully, to manage with Kirk Cousins. Because <clears throat> I think I said last week I expected Cousins to throw about one or two interceptions. I was right. Again, I'm only going to give him blame for one because the other receiver fell down and that was just a horrible perspective of timing. But I look at the Jets and say this. They're going to have a better receiving core in this matchup depending on health. And they're going to have... Kirk's going to have a much tougher time going against the Jets' secondary compared to Ryan Fitzpatrick going against the depleted secondary of the Redskins. You know, again, it should be a you know, competitive game. And can the Redskins, you know... Pull off an upset, yeah, they're good. Philadelphia went into New York earlier this year 
and pulled off the win. And I definitely think that the uh, New York Jets, uh, or the, the, the Redskins, could, could do the same thing. But when I look at this game, like I said, you got two running games. I'm, I'll give Ivory the edge in that regard. The offensive lines, um, I'll give the Redskins a bit of an edge there because they have Bill Callahan, who's done a phenomenal job with that. But when you look at the uh, depleted receiving core of the Redskins, what they have, if Deshaun doesn't go again, you're only going to have Garcon. He'll get shut down by Revis. Cromarty can shut down Grant, whoever they have. They're not going to have Jordan Reed probably again because not only has concussion, he has a knee and ankle injury. And I just, I just see, <clears throat> with that depleted of an offense, I just don't see the, the Redskins doing that much on the, in the air to do enough to beat this Jets team. So that's what taking the Jets to beat the Redskins. <clears throat> Vikings over Chiefs. Um, Minnesota's coming off a bye. They're well rested. They're prepared. Um, and it just came down to this for me. Jamal Charles is out. <clears throat> and with that much of the offense, he's <coughs> he's produced about... <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I'm still coughing a bit. Come on a second. He's produced about 30% of the Chiefs' entire offense. And with that much gone, this Vikings defense can do enough damage and to eliminate Niall Davis. And if Alex Smith's inability to throw the deep ball only have one receiver, you double-team Macklin, you can shut down Davis, you basically have shut down the Chiefs' offense. Um, and again, the Vikings are 2-0 at home, all with 2 on the road. That's an advantage. Um, Bridgewater's played pretty... Well, since that week one game, he's had his, you know, or well, again, he's had his, he had a bad week one game and a bad week three game, but he's shown some improvement, you know, week two and four <clears throat> against this depleted uh, Chief secondary with the weapons he has. I believe that the Vikings just have too much talent, and the Chiefs have lost too much talent and don't have enough talent to compete against the Vikings defense. Uh, to win this game. So that's what we're going to take the Vikings to beat the Chiefs. Um, Arizona at Pittsburgh. This is a cool game because this is Bruce Arians' first game back in Pittsburgh since he had left in 2011 to go on this incredible um, four-year run that he's uh, a Mr. Having. Um, and I'm going to take Arizona just because, again, the Cardinals are 2-0 on the road this year. Um... They're coming off a incredibly dominating performance against Detroit. <clears throat> and I just look at Pittsburgh <clears throat> and go, I just don't know if Michael Vick can beat up the no-fly zone of Arizona. Um, you're going to have Peterson on Brown. You're going to have, I think, Johnson or Bethel on uh, Bryant, which will be, I think that will be a match where you can exploit. The Steelers have the edge of running game. Um... And and defense and defense, I'll give Arizona that edge. Receivers, um, that's about a better crapshoot too. So when you have about an, pretty much an even game where you can have one side each and everything else is about the same, even the offensive lines a bit. Um, I'm gonna give Arizona the win just because Carson Palmer, I think they said, is 14 and three over the last 17 games he's played as an Arizona Cardinal. That's incredibly impressive for him. He put up another three touchdowns, you know, by, by doing very little last week. And even though, again, I expect Michael Vick to beat up the Chargers defense, which has given up a lot of points and yards this year, um, I don't expect him to play as well in Arizona against that defense. Again, if they can control the clock with Bell and use some play actions and get, you know, to, you know, Bryant or, you know, use Marcus Wheaton or Hayward Bay, this game could, you know, be competitive. And I also think that you do have the uh, jet lag of, you know, West Coast teams going out to the East Coast, Arizona going out to Pittsburgh. And also in the spirit of uh, the 50th anniversary, this is a rematch of Super Bowl 43. <laughs> which Pittsburgh won. But, I think Arizona, they have the better secondary 
that Michael Vick has to face. And at the end of the day, right now, I'll take Carson Palmer in this offense <clears throat> over a third start Michael Vick that could be 0-2 in his last starts if he loses tonight against San Diego. Right now. So that's how I'm going to take the Arizona Cardinals to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, Tennessee over Miami. Um, I just think, again, Miami, they've had two weeks to prepare for this game. They, they fired Joe Philbin last week about time. 24-28 and 28 as a you know head coach. Kind of lifeless. Didn't really have a lot of motivation to him. Um, even though, again, Ryan Tannehill, boy, did I... Uh, <coughs> Read a lot of stuff about him um, this week. He apparently was yelling at practice squad players at walkthroughs, and he made a great comment of saying, "Was it over when the Germans bombed bombed Pearl Harbor?" And that was an actual quote he said, which I couldn't believe how stupid he was. He needs to kind of refresh on his history. And again, I'll repeat that quote. He actually told a reporter, Jeff Darlington, I think it was. He said, "Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor?" That was what Ryan Tannehill said. The quarterback of the Miami Dolphins, he's making $96 million, said that quote. Um, and I know that, um, you know, they're all, you know, they're all trying to get through. They fired uh, Kevin Coyle, which should have been done because, honestly, that was pathetic. Of all the talent he had on that defense, the fact that they were dead last, basically, in the league, that's just underachieving in its highest form. <clears throat> and I know Dan Carpen, uh, uh, no, wait, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, is it Dan or... Okay. And I know his name is Dan something. Um, but he, he, you know, he's a former tight end in the league. Uh, uh, Dan Campbell, there we go, Dan Campbell, that's Nick. Uh, I was, I was thinking of a kicker from Buffalo. <clears throat> um, he's a former tight end in the league. He's a big guy. And he already seems like he's shown a lot more personality and fire than Joe Philbin had in the last, you know, three plus years. Um, and I remember, they, and I know they've already started uh, running the Oklahoma drill, which is a very physical, very tough drill. Did you run? You know, you know. It's, I've seen Cincinnati do it. I've seen other, other, another, uh, uh, other pro teams. Sorry about that. I've seen a. Uh, I've seen a few other pro teams run that drill. So I, I know he's definitely trying to build up the culture. But this is the first week he's going to, you know, have any head coaching, you know, uh, power. And I don't know how he can, you know, call a game. This is a tight end coach on the staff. This is not a coordinator. And I'm just looking at Tennessee. And, again, they've been competitive. They've shown they can have a defense and be competitive. <coughs> and, <coughs> and they've shown that they can have an offense to be competitive. And I just think, again, if they can shut down Tyrod Taylor with, you know, with his legs, I think they can get to Ryan Tannehill. You know, that offensive line in Miami really hasn't done that much. They didn't, <coughs> they didn't add anybody, you know, that effective. And I just think Tennessee has enough talent with Mariota that Mariota will get his second win. I think that he has enough skill. He has enough talent around him. And I'm just not buying Ryan Tannehill right now. You know, excuse me, can uh, Dan Campbell uh, do anything? You know, who knows? But I think Tennessee has enough talent defensively and offensively that in the first week of Dan, uh, Dan Campbell's uh, coaching career, he's going to get a loss. You know, again, do I, do, will Miami improve? <clears throat> I think they will. But against this Titan team, which has looked pretty impressive throughout the season, I think Tennessee, with just with their experience at coaching and talent, will get enough to win this game over a new era struggling Miami Dolphins team. That's the thing in the Titans to beat the Dolphins. Um, Seattle over Carolina. Um, simple. Seattle's two and zero at home. They rarely lose at home. They only have two losses at home over the last few years. <coughs> Carolina. I know they're four now, but. <coughs> I've always thought they've been the most overrated 4-0 team out of the six 4-0 teams left. And 
Well, Cincinnati had A.J. Green and Marvin Jones and Eifert and everybody else in that offense that had big weapons. Carolina only has Greg Olson because you have Ted Ginn, Cotchery, uh, Funches, Philly Brown. That leads you to boom, can shut down those guys easily. And if Kerry Williams can't do that, which again, he's been picked on by Cincinnati and everybody. But again, as a Raven fan, I know Kerry Williams pretty well. That's what he does. Um, I just think Seattle, they're at home, and they're playing an overrated Carolina team that's going to get their first legitimate test of the year. If they can win this game, I'm going to say this. That very Seattle season right there, and that's going to give me a lot more respect for Carolina. And maybe say that, that five, this 5 and a start was not just because of their schedule. This team is better than what... <coughs> this team is better to maybe say that they are good enough to be a 5 and a squad. So, again, it should be a, you know another low-scoring defensive game, rematch of the 2014 divisional round game. But I'm taking Seattle just because they're at home. They haven't lost at home. They rarely lose at home. And they're playing an offense that is way less talented than what Cincinnati had, besides Greg Olson. So, that's why I'll, I'll take uh, <coughs> Seattle to, be, to beat Carolina. Um, San Francisco over Baltimore. Uh, let me just say this. Um, it's been really frustrating to be a Ravens fan this year. We've blown three fourth quarter leads, and we've lost all four games by 17 points combined. <clears throat> we are, and I'm going to say this is a Ravens fan, and any Ravens fans that want to get on me for this, we are a bunch of losers. We are a bunch of chokers. Okay? And you could say, well, if it wasn't for this, 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 you know, we could be 5-0. and up. But you know what? We're not. We are 1-4, and four, and we let Josh McCown throw for a Cleveland Brown <coughs> franchise record. 451 yards. Let me put some other things at you know at you. The Browns had not won in Baltimore in seven years. Josh McCown was tied with Brandon Whedon for the longest active losing streak by a quarterback in the league. And now Whedon is overtaken that with 11. But we let him get off the side, you know, yesterday. Um. And I think just the other, you know, it's that we, you know, we've had a lot of injuries, but every team has injuries. Okay? And nobody can give us that. You know, nobody can say, well, we've had injuries. I get that. But we've been in every single game, even throughout the injuries. <laughs> if we got blown out in every game, I would say, yeah, you're right. It's because of injuries. But we're not. We're competing. But we're not being able to finish games. And I think that again. Um, San Francisco... They actually played a decent game for the first time uh, <clears throat> in about three weeks. Yeah, they played a decent game. Um, and I, actually, again, the biggest thing for me, ironically, and you might say I'm being a hypocrite, the biggest reason why I'm taking the Niners to beat us is because of the injuries. No Chris Canny. No Talia Farrell. No Crockett. <clears throat> no Crockett Gilmore. No Rashad Perryman. No Steve Smith. Probably. No Steve Smith, probably. Um, um, no Terrell Suggs. No Justin Forsett, maybe. You know, again, if you keep you know piling on the talent that's lost on this team, Jeremy Ross, the former Lions kick returner, I think was our second leading receiver, behind Clamar Aiken. Um, so, again, can Baltimore win this game? Yeah, they can. Do I want us to win? Absolutely. I always want the Ravens to win. But when I look at this game, I just think San Francisco, with the way they've looked, <coughs> and how pathetic our defense has looked, I think San Francisco has enough talent to win this game. And I just don't think we have enough talent healthy, or we have the right mindset to go into San Francisco to win this game. It's kind of ironic because just three years ago, these were the two Super Bowl teams. And look at what happens three... Just just three years later, folks, we're now playing in the Loser Bowl instead of the Super Bowl. Because now both these teams are 1-4 and four and have looked like absolute garbage for the most part this year. 
But again, I'm taking San Francisco just because I think Baltimore doesn't have the right mindset. And also, I think Baltimore just lost too much talent for us to win <coughs> this game. Since I'm taking the uh, Niners to beat the Ravens, uh, Green Bay over San Diego, um, that Green Bay defense was incredibly impressive. Uh, they picked off Nick Foles four times, um, which was incredibly sad. And now that Foles-Bradford trade looks about even again because Sam Bradford's <laughs> put two decent games to <coughs> together. And uh, sorry, guys. Uh, I know I started really well in this video, but my nose got stuffed up. And uh, I started coughing again. And I'm still coughing. And I hope I can get over this soon because I know I've been coughing for the last uh, four weeks. But... I'm going to take Green Bay to beat San Diego in this game because they're at home. And I know Aaron Rodgers, 587 attempts, <coughs> um, pick streaks over. And he did have three turnovers yesterday, which is very rare for Aaron Rodgers to have. But St. Louis, San Diego doesn't nearly have as ferocious a front. Their defense has given up way too many points. And if you gave me Rodgers or Rivers in a shootout, I'll take Aaron Rodgers any day of the week over Phillip Rivers in a shootout-type game. Um, again, it should be a competitive game. Again, I think San Diego, they can make some plays. Phillip Rivers, you know, has played okay, you know, against Green Bay, or he's got a good enough arm and good enough talent around him that he can fight. But with just Green Bay at home, they've won. They've won about 12 straight at home now with Rodgers at the helm. And I just don't see that ending against the San Diego team, which has shown that they can be, you know, Inconsistent. You know, again, they have a big game tonight against Pittsburgh. Um, but that's what I'm taking the Packers to beat the Chargers. Um, New England over Indy. New England's the best team in football. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it's true. Um, Tom Brady scored 11 touchdowns and no interceptions. Uh, he's been on fire. The defense has shut down, or the defense has played pretty impressively over the last, you know, few weeks, even without the Royal Revis. <coughs> or Browner or Wolfork. The offensive line, Deion Lewis, has become a great scat back and running back for this team. And I'm just looking at Indian going. They beat Tennessee, Houston, and Jacksonville. A combined three and eleven in their fourteen games. This is New England. And also, New England will be motivated. This is the team that started the whole deflate gate controversy. I guarantee you Belichick will bring that up this week in their meetings and in their practices. And I just think they will annihilate the Indianapolis Colts because of that motivation. And also just because, you know, Andrew Luck, he hasn't won a game yet this year. Unbelievable. But that's a true stat. Andrew Luck has not won a game this year. And amazingly, I don't think he's going to win this game. I know, you know, they rested him and, you know, they put Hasselbeck in, which I would, I would have done. But I'm going to take uh, Luck, you know, uh, New England here. Uh, just because, again, they just have way too much talent. They're going to be extremely motivated. And I just don't expect Andrew Luck to have a good enough game <coughs> to beat this New England team. And last year, um, they lost 42-20 to with Jonas Gray, who's now, think about that, Jonas Gray is now on the Miami Dolphins. The guy that, you know, took over the world for a week, Jonas Gray, the undrafted rook, you know, the undrafted rookie at another game, is now in the Dolphins. And New England's still rolling. So, again, I'm going to take New England too motivated, too powerful to win this game against a indie team that really hasn't faced that much competition over the last few weeks. And finally, uh, Giants over Eagles. <coughs> the third up, <coughs> the Eagles played their best game of the year. As much as I'm not a Sam Bradford fan, he played his best game of the year. Even though, again, they were, there were two pathetic red zone interceptions, but still he completed about 60% of his passes, threw for 330 yards, and he threw two touchdowns. Very impressive. The running game had about 160 yards on the ground. That's what they needed. DeMarco and, uh, DeMarco and Ryan had an equal game. Defense caused about three or four turnovers. Incredibly impressive. But th they are going up against the Giants. In the last four meetings in Philadelphia, these two teams have split the last <laughs> the last four games. I'm going to take the Giants in this one. 
because they're on a roll. They had a phenomenal game against the Niners. And Eli Manning had a phenomenal game. Um, you know, I think he threw for 441 yards, three TDs, and a pick. Um, and that pick was a pretty awful decision. But <clears throat> I'm not sold <clears throat> on this Eagles offense being able to string two games, <clears throat> two successful games running and passing the football together. I'm just not sold on I think that you played a pathetic Saints team, and that showed how bad the Saints were compared to how good you guys were. Okay? Um, but <clears throat> I'm taking the Giants because, again, um, the Giants, they're on a roll. Hopefully they get Victor Cruz back. They lost Easton and Randall last night to a concussion and hamstring injury. That could be big. <clears throat> and uh, everybody out there, prayers to tight end Daniel Fells, who's battling a MRSA infection. And right now, I think he's fighting for his life. So I hope he is okay. And hopefully they don't, they don't have to amputate his leg. Um, but prayers to him. But I'm taking the Giants because um, I look at them and say, they're on a roll. <coughs> And this Philadelphia team, I'm just not sold on this offense. I'm sold on this defense. This defense has carried this team through the first five games. <clears throat> I'm just not sold on their offense. They can put two games together like this against a decent Giants team that's gaining momentum and confidence going into Philadelphia. And also, the Giants will be motivated because last year in Philadelphia, they got shut out 27 to nothing by Nick Foles and the Eagles. So, there's that. So, <clears throat> sorry guys for my nose and everything. Hopefully in the next week I will get better. I know I keep saying that, but I hope I will. But that's it for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Check out the NFL YouTube Prognosticators page. I'm going to put in a link. Please join our group. It's great to talk to people. Um, you know, If you want to talk to me as well, that's great. Shout out to the guys like Geo Nose, uh, Billy B, Hackbox, um, Kid Mikey, um, uh, Bridgewater's Finest, uh, uh, Half Moon, Stephen Coleman and his picks, uh, the football guru, John Glover, he's really good. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> and all those guys. Shout outs to them. <coughs> Watch their picks. They do a great job. And also Edwin Lerner, uh, Keith Bailey, and uh, Nan's Noodles. Check out all those guys' picks. They're great. And uh, that's it. So good luck to all the teams, all coaches, all players, uh, all fantasy players, and all fellow prognosticators. And until next week, this is Matt the Fanatic signing off. Till then, so long.